please sit now as we come to the sermon time. And if you would like to follow along in your Bible, it's page 1009 in the new Bibles that have been put in the pews. Friends, my theme for today is come to Jesus, our mediator. And my hopeful confidence is that you've done that. You've come to Jesus, so I'm reinforcing the faith that you have. The call to come to Jesus is all over the New Testament. Jesus says, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden. He is our saviour, our rescuer, our mediator, and our Lord. Now, as we listen to the Lord teaching us from Hebrews 12, we get a picture that God is utterly holy and so is sternly and severely against sin of all kinds. How can we frail and imperfect men and women come to such a holy God? It is through Jesus Christ, and that's the way he's the mediator between us and God. So as we come to think about this part of scripture, please pray with me for God's blessing. Lord Jesus Christ, just as our Bible reading encourages us to do, here we come by faith to you, our mediator, our go-between, taking us under your wing of redemption as we come with confidence to your Father and our Father, God. Bless us now, we pray, as we receive your teaching in this part of the letter to the Hebrews and enable us to live our lives with that holiness and reverence towards you now and all the way to the end of our days. Amen. Well, friends, in this chapter, I want to begin at verses 12 and 13, where we were told to lift up your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees. Make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be out, put out of joint, but rather be healed. So this is a word to ourselves to respond to God's stirring word to Joshua in the Old Testament, when God said to him, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid, do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Now later in our service, I like to say the prayer, the Lord be with you. And this is the idea, the Lord is with us and he's helping us as we look to Jesus. If you remember that earlier sermon last week. So we're thinking about that and we're able to run with perseverance the race marked out for us fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. So, with that new courage and strength in our hearts and fire in our belly, we work hard for peace in our relationships, especially in God's family. So we read here, strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Now, sometimes it takes real effort and grace and humility to keep the peace. As God says through Paul in Ephesians 4, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. So let's think about the Berwick Anglican Church as an example of where this unity should be seen through loving relationships in the unity, the living a life worthy of that and striving for peace with everybody. We don't always get on with everybody, but we can live at peace with everybody. And that's my prayer for us all in the Berwick Anglican Church. However, sometimes peace is impossible, as when Christians go off on false doctrines and call sinful behaviour good and godly. There's no peace in that situation. Peace is not possible for us also when we're striving for peace and we're called to strive for holiness without which no one will see the Lord. So I can't see how those people who call themselves Christians and deliberately live unholy lives will ever see the Lord. 
It's not as though they're stumbling in something. They've set their minds to on that action, and that's wrong. Well, the Lord, when God calls us to be Jesus' disciples, we're called to obedience, not just to easy salvation without any discipleship. We're called to be disciples, and that means living holy lives in obedience to the Lord, striving for that peace and that unity. Well, there's this question of, of morality, and um, besides immorality, we can also sin by turning away from the Lord, as the next verse 15 says. See that no one fails to obtain the grace of God and that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many have become defiled. Now, that phrase was how Moses in the Old Testament described apostasy, apostasy meaning when you turn away from the faith. And Moses was teaching about that kind of attitude where people are turned away from the Lord. He says that's a root of bitterness. It's a kind of an agricultural illustration whereby you've got something which you could eat and it would be bitter and poisonous. That's what turning away from the Lord is like. So I beg you all, please, to remain firm in your faith and devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ and let nothing ever turn you away from that. Well, the next issue here concerns sexual ethics and holiness, and the writer says... See to it that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. And you know that afterwards he would desired to inherit the blessing, but he was rejected, for he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. God tells us that sexual sin is unholiness, and that this teaching is all over the Bible, especially in the New Testament. Think of Esau. He was one of two twins. Esau was born first and Jacob just a few minutes later. Anyway, he was technically the older one. But before those twins were ever born, his mother went off to pray to the Lord about her pregnancy. And the word she received through some man of God, it doesn't say who it was, was that the older will serve the younger. So she remembered that. So when Jacob was born, she knew that he was the one through whom God would bless his people, the chosen people. And in fact, Jacob is the ancestor of our Lord Jesus by many, many generations. What about Esau? Well, Esau married pagan women who were a pain to Isaac and Rebekah. It was a real hassle. And... Jacob didn't. He found a wife who followed the Lord. Well, Isaac, their father, went against the Lord's revelation to Rebekah because he said, I'm going to bless Esau because he makes nice meals for me, as though his stomach was going to overrule his faith. That was a silly thing. And we read um, um, that Esau sold his birthright for a single meal, and though he repented afterwards, he never got it. So that's the way in which Esau despised his birthright and Jacob inherited it and was the means of God blessing us. As we move on and now, we contrast our glorious future in Christ with a scary part of the Old Testament. So our writer says that we Christians do not have to face the kind of thunder and lightning that Moses and the Israelites got at Mount Sinai. We don't have that. So we read, You have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages would be spoken to them. For they couldn't endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it'll be stoned. Instead, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. I'm glad we don't have that faced. We do face troubles and trials, I know, but not that kind of thing. So, what have we come to? What is our prospect that Paul describes as the hope of glory? 
Let's look in verse 22. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. That is so very much like John's writing in Revelation, telling us how wonderful it will be to share eternal life in the city of the living God called the heavenly Jerusalem. That's where we'll live. Who will be there with us? We read innumerable angels in festal gathering. Have you ever seen an angel? I haven't. But I read stories about situations in which there seemed to be a person who was there and then gone. And as though that was an angel who stepped in to help at a time and we don't know if that's the way things worked out. Anyway, that's the angels will be there with us and we'll worship the Lord with all of them. Who else will be there? Well, you can tell me for sure. They're all the others in God's family, all the Christians under the New Covenant, and all those Old Testament folk too, who didn't know about Jesus, but had their faith in the Lord. They'll be there too. So we read all the uh, people there, that our writer describes them, the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. This assembly word is actually the Greek word ecclesia, you know, ecclesiastical. It's come into English as the word meaning church, but we've got the word church, which is actually meaning about the Lord, but that's a separate matter. So here we have this assembly of people, a whole stack of people, including us and all those angels as well. It'll be wonderful to be there, gathered for worship and teaching and um, here we are on earth gathered for that and also the Lord's Supper, healing and prayers and everything else that goes on in God's family here. Well, when you read that word, the firstborn, you might say, you can only have one firstborn in any family. But it's like a status of those who are specially blessed. So everybody, however you came in your family, you're still a firstborn in this category meaning specially blessed. So we thank the Lord God for that role, that we have that status. And we are all mentioned in verse 23, a second time, as the spirits of the righteous made perfect. How are we made perfect in heaven? It's like this. God, in, Re in Revelation 7, God gave a, John a picture of all these people. He said, he saw a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes. Now those white robes are symbolical of the righteousness that Jesus Christ gives us when he takes our sin away and gives us his righteousness. That's why you and I will be perfect in heaven without any sin, all finished and gone, no more temptation or anything like that. It'll be wonderful to be saved, rescued, redeemed and justified. All because of Jesus, our mediator. At this stage, before the general resurrection at Jesus' second coming, when we're in heaven, if we happen to die before Jesus comes back, we'll be at peace, we'll be worshipping the Lord, but not yet given those resurrection bodies which will be given at Jesus' second coming. That's all part of God's teaching in the New Testament. There are the angels and all the people, all of whom God created. But of course, the focus of our life up there will be on God, the judge of all. And how wonderful it will be to be with God the Father, the judge of all, and with Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Now that sprinkled blood is taking us back to Moses' time. See, under the Old Testament, when they had this sacrifice and killed this animal, Moses took some of the blood and sprinkled it on the people and the, and the um, equipment around the tent and so on. So that was to symbolise forgiveness and atonement. Under the New Testament... We are under the Lord Jesus Christ as our Redeemer, our Saviour, who died to save us. Now, his blood was shed on the cross, but it affects us in the sense that we benefit by that forgiveness. That's why 
we read here, the sprinkle, to be sprinkled with his blood means to be forgiven, redeemed, justified and cleansed from our sin. So please be careful to take to heart all that God is telling us in his Bible, especially the warning like this in verse 25. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns us from heaven. Wow. Those who reject Jesus as mediator and advocate and all his salvation, I'm sad to say they're going to end up in hell. That's exactly what God's told us. So my campaign is to have as few people in hell as possible and get everybody I can into God's family. With another reference to God, revelation, God's revelation to Moses and the Israelites at Mount Sinai, we read, at that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, yet once more I will shake not only the earth but also the heavens. That's a quote from Haggai, one of the minor prophets in the Old Testament, and used that phrase about the Lord's second coming, which he didn't know clearly about, except that he know, knew that the, the judge of all the earth would come and judge the world in equity. So the destruction of the present world and the creation of the new heavens and new earth is something we learn about in Scripture. Yes, things we know here in our physical universe will certainly be shaken and removed. And the phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of the things that are shaken and the things that have been made in order that the things may, that cannot be shaken may remain. That's our kingdom. So don't worry about these changes. Instead, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. We come to God who is the consuming fire against all sin. We come to him through Jesus the mediator. We are saved and rescued and we have that loving relationship with God. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So remember my theme for today, come to Jesus our mediator. And as we have listened to the Lord teaching us from Hebrews 12, so we've seen this message that God is utterly holy and so sternly and severely against all kinds of sin. We can see how we frail men and women can relate to such a holy God. It's through Jesus, our mediator, our saviour. Now, you will need a hymn book 